Good evening, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Stir in the Pot podcast, where I am your host, Gary Bryant. And with today, we will be talking about operating and working in the security field in Philadelphia. Uh, we're going to be talking about some current events. We're going to be talking about the, the field of work that we do on this topic. And we're going to kick it. Um, Angie and Webb, if y'all can, if y'all can share the pot, share uh, share this video so we can spread the word. To, uh, How do you do that? Um, so you should be seeing it. You should possibly be able to see it on your Facebook. I don't know if you're connected to like Facebook and the, uh, the app that we're on, but you should be able to share it. Um, Let me look on. I'm no, nah, I'm on like a internet thing. Yeah, um, yeah. So. Um, so yeah, it's 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 on. It's it's definitely uh on the uh platform and stuff like that. I am going. I'm def- I'm gonna share it to uh Facebook and to like the security group. Um, I don't see how to do it on Facebook, but it'll probably be easier for me on Facebook. We can do it this way too. You probably gotta go all the way down to like Ducky Mom's house. All right. Ducky Mom lives. So here we go. Um, so for people who may not know and people who do know and Angie or Webb, uh, won't y'all tell the people a little bit about yourselves and what y'all are into when it comes to this full of work? Even one of y'all can go first. I guess I can go first. Um, well, the field that I'm in right now is uh, armed security for Allah. Um, I can say is like okay, working for Allah is not the best company I have worked for. Um, they just pay more. Um, I started in this for a long, like maybe five years ago. I've been doing this for this long. Um, working at the ship repair, I've only been here for a year. It depends on the contract. The longer the ship here, the longer the contract. Ship leave, we leave. And that's the only downside about working for Allah is that they can place you really anywhere and your pay can shift. Uh-huh. So I'm not really excited about that. Also, um, with the company I work for now, it's like, it's, it's really lack of communication. But like I said, I love security. I love what I do. It's not, I'm not stopping here. I don't want to get stuck. I do want to yes. go back and get my private investigations. I don't believe I want to do law enforcement because right now in the city of Philadelphia is not the best. Um, okay. I tried out for transit police, got in, but once I started like really watching the news and you know, really just getting into the politics of it, it wasn't for me either. <laughs> I'd okay. rather be safe than sorry. Um, and that's where I'm at with everything. Okay. How about you, Webb? Okay. Um, um I've been around the block, man. <laughs> so tell the people. I'm an old head, um, sort of young old head. So I started off unarmed in Trent, New Jersey, um, you know, cut my teeth in the, the heart of the gang city. I'm from Trent, New Jersey. So um, where communication was your best option. And uh, if you couldn't use communication, then one had to use um, come alongs, soft come alongs. We'll put it like that for my force continuum and my uh um, you know, more professional folks out there to understand what I'm saying. Um, so for me, I've done um, fugitive recovery. I've done uh-huh. executive protection. Um, I do a lot of armed security. I've done armored truck work. So I've kind of been around. I've kind of been around. I've, I've even started, I've even worked at the mall. I was the mall security. So um, okay. not not too much. I've done loss prevention. That was, that was for some main, name brand stores. So okay. that, was, that was cool. I've got a, I've got a little bit of a, uh, history on me i've done um six, casino uh surveillance plain clothes okay um, all those things so yeah yeah I've, I've i've got a little bit under my belt i'm on my third tour of um a 235 so you know that has to renew every four years so that kind yeah. of tells you the the time in there so okay yeah, that's me all right cool cool so i guess uh i need to tell you all a little bit about myself um they call I, I got many nicknames depending on what circle I'm rolling with. Uh, I'm Gary. Some places I'm Big Guy. Some places I'm G. Some places I'm Bryant. 
Um, I've been in the security field probably for about 10 years now. I've been doing, uh, I've done everything from armed, I've done mobile security, I've done, uh, um, shoot, what else? Uh, uh, close, I mean, they change the name all the time, bodyguard, close protection, or whatever. I protected somebody. <laughs> um, you know, I, I have a passion for this field. I think that this field is a, a, a job field that's overlooked, but that's very needed. Um, and sometimes that can be pretty detrimental to to the field because a lot of people who, to me, who 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 need security, people don't know they need security until something bad happens. Like a lot of people have suggested uh, securities in so many places, and they denied it, and then something terrible happens. Um, and that's kind of like the purpose, the reason why I'm doing this. I do this podcast on Sundays about the security field just to bring awareness to people. Um, I've done everything from, I've done security at strip clubs. I've done security for the best clubs in the city. Um, I've done security for movie sets, TV shows. So I've done security for churches. So um, it's a, uh, it's a very wide spectrum. And in times that we live in, I believe security is overlooked, but well needed, well needed. So um, I've had my at 235 probably for six years, I think, out of that uh, out of that time. And this is what I do right now. Right now, I do corporate security um, where the pay is very, very well. I'm also a U.S. government contractor part time um, where I work for an Air Force base. So that's my spiel. So um, basically, you know, I'm going to ask a few questions and I want you guys to give me your your feeling about it. You know, tell me tell me how you feel. Tell me what you think. And I want you guys to be very transparent. I don't you know, don't hold back. You know, this, you know, we ain't going to be talking about n nobody or nothing like that. So I want you all to, you know, from your experience and what you know, just keep it a bean and let's let's talk about it. So. The first thing I want to talk about is, so in Philadelphia, as of today, we are at 524 mur homicides. We are at 524 homicides in the city of Philadelphia. And I would like to know, what do you guys think that agents can do better to help the homicide rate? And you guys can answer however you want. You know, one can go first, the other, however you want to go. Go ahead, ladies first. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> okay, so for me, I, I want to ask the actual question to that question. What you mean as far as the, what can we do? I don't think there's nothing that we can do. So, when I'm from the neighborhood. I'm I'm from the areas okay. that are having these problems. And to be honest with you, as far as agents go, since we're talking about security, um, I just feel like dress, is dress as your appearance. You know what I'm saying? Like everybody wants to do security, but nobody has the proper training. Okay. So you, you're speaking about homicides, but I feel like that's a politic thing because, you know, I go down to City Hall. I've been in internships at City Hall. I have yes. done things at City Hall. And I feel like they have these meetings every day. Almost every day they have a meeting at City Hall about the problems that occur in the city. But what I see is you'll have a police officer stationed somewhere, let's say 15th and Lehigh, where a shooting just happened. I've seen this police, this police officer every day, every single day when I drove down this block, he was there. One night he wasn't there, like three people got shot. And it's just like, it's a high demand for police officer. It's a high demand for just anybody that's sitting in a government seat, you know, for them to do something. So when you say, what can security do it's nothing that we can do but do our job when we need to do our job because as a citizen you know being licensed to carry i can only do but so much when i'm not in a uniform and then you still have to think about the consequences of the action if something is taken let's say if i was out somebody's getting robbed in the store yes i have the right to pull my gun but i also have to think about it as is my aim right? What's going to happen if if he does die? 
and I go to jail because there's no protection for security guards. There's none. The police have the their whole system hooked up to where if they get locked up, they have the government backing them. We have no backing. As citizens, we have no backing. If you can't afford a lawyer, you're going to jail. If you can't prove that you were in the right to actually defend yourself or someone else, then what what are we doing? Uh-huh. So how can we help the city? I feel like whatever post that we have as far as maybe we can get together, maybe we can do, like you said, live broadcasting, like really, let's really talk about it because it is an issue. That's my take on it. I don't, I don't, I can't say that we can do much because mm-hmm. right now with so many, how can I say it? <clears throat> so many marches, so many people speaking out about it and nothing is still being done. So if nothing is being done when the community itself is saying that they're hurting and nobody is doing anything, what can security really do? Okay. How about you, Web? Oh, man, this is easy. Um, I'm <laughs> sorry. Uh, what's your name? Abby? What's her name? Angie. Angie. I'm sorry. I just disagree with you. If you ain't met me, my name is web so you might heard about me somewhere i'm the guy that addresses people and ages when they come into the field and they're sloppy and so i mean that's something different and so um it, it but also bleeds into what you were saying andy so i sort of there but i disagree with the part where you said there's nothing we can do and i believe that if some of the corner stores and some of the local business owners would get together and then now come up with a certain pot and say, okay, hey, listen, um, the police can't, won't, will, uh, I don't know, I'm not going to point fingers, but hey, I'm in the business of protecting and I'm in the business of providing for my family. And so if that means that we can get some agents out there, just like there was during the riots, and have them, uh, you know, create a certain perimeter, just like you go down, what is that, I don't know, Broad Street, and they got the unarmed guys out there, they, they all never just about every corner, and they're getting paid to do it. So why can't this idea or this ideology be bled out into that area and or um i'm gonna get myself in trouble here but i'm just gonna tell the truth here and or the state police be a little bit more stringent stringent on enforcing certain policies and procedures on sloppy agents or fake agents and then therefore um our rep our rep will now go up and then we can be paid in which we want and which one can be professional and so that i believe that will cut down on the crime because now um you got real professionals out there the city is enforcing it and maybe they can't pay the tab for police officers to sit there but they can pay for a private agent to guard their property confound okay so my question to you web would have to be why hasn't it happened yet do you feel like it's a lack of knowledge? Maybe the owners don't, like like you said, these store no, the pro- owners, property owners don't know. I believe I believe the problem is, is that you get, um, oh man, I'm going to get myself in a lot of trouble here. Okay, I just, but you said, we, you said tell the truth. So anybody knows my personality ever worked with me, they know. We're about to snap. So, because this is like down my alley. So one thing I would say, the owners, you can't blame them because... You get Bobby and them. I'll use that name. Thank God Bobby came out. Um, and they go down to the store, and now they don't know the first thing or anything about real security, and they're charging them. Just give me just give me 60 bucks. Just give me, you know, just give me 80 bucks. And now the real professional goes down there, and you not, you're not going to get that. So you're going to get the rinking thing guy. You're going to get the guy that's unprofessional. You're going to get the guy that, that's the homies. That's a by boy. He's going to let you in with the ratchet. Oh, that's Quan, man. He ain't going to do that. Yeah, go down there. You know, you're not going to get the professional that's going to um, not know everybody and be able to enforce a certain thing. There's a lot of agents that don't know use of force. A lot of agents don't know that you should have proper uniform. You should have a level three holster, in my opinion. Make sure your stuff is ready to go. Do you have a tourniquet on your duty belt? Like what? What items do you have? Like so, so we have we have a comment kind of like to what we're talking about, and I just read them out, and you know we address the comments as they come in. So, uh, Joseph uh, D. Jesus or D. 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 Jesus D. Jesus, I believe the proper way to say it. 
Um, he said that the problem is Philadelphia, the stores can hire you, but it has to do with the mayor and the DA. Uh, then he's also said you can come work in the county and there's no issues. Uh, it's all po political in Philadelphia. How do y'all feel about that? I'd have to say, yeah, it is political. But while they're being political, it doesn't, there still needs to be a stopping of the violence. There still can be, um, there are people like us that are real professionals that can go to areas and protect them or at least show a presence, a strong presence, but one has to pay for that. I don't, I don't know. The city, it is a, it's a political thing, but I'm going to now be quiet. Though. No, speak your mind. How about you, Angie? How you feel about it? Um, like the, the I mean, comment kind of said, it, it was more a political thing. You have to go through a chain of command. Everything is going through like mostly a chain of command. So us hopping in the community is secure. You have to have people that actually want to do it because you have some agents that just don't want to do certain neighborhoods. And you have to be realistic about it. And you have to be able to be like, this is what how much I want. And are you going to be able to pay me that? So and the way the economy is going right now, can't nobody afford anything. So people don't have jobs. People uh -huh. are losing their homes. Mm -hmm. People are moving out. People are moving in. The crime is up, but there's still not like like you said, it's politics. There still has to be something done in that in the big house. Put it like that downtown. They have to bring their presence for the community because the community already don't trust the police. The community already don't trust the government because they seen what their hand has given over this last year and some change. So it's like, okay, we're going to community. We talk about these issues. We have these issues. We take it down to city hall. Maybe you can set up guards here. Maybe you can set up guards here. Can y'all pay us this to be here? But if they're like, no, then what? We're back at square, square one. So I can't okay. really, it, it could be a 50-50 chance because they're having meetings down there all the time and there's nothing being done. It's still homicides are happening. You got a point? I just, I think that, I think that, oh man, I'm get myself in some smoke here. You what I, what on I your mind. <laughs> right? You speak your I mind, feel, man. I just feel like, um, the eight, like, if you, oh man, all right, whatever. Listen, bro. If you call yourself agent and you have the title agent, then you ought to respect the last name that you came with and go out to work and give the best quality of service and unite. But there's too many agents that are just everybody, everybody for they sell. It ain't where it ain't for me. I don't know them. Why is it like that? Like, it ain't he got uniform on. And not uh -huh. ripped jeans and the duty belt around it and all that old weird, all that old crazy stuff that gets in the way. But one has to come to the young ones and say, listen, man, nobody's going to take you serious with Tim's on out here. I'm sorry. All right. Thank you. No, I, I think, I think, you know, I, 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 I'm also a subscriber of, listen, man, you know, if we're going to do this right. <clears throat> and what we have to understand is we can't, us as agents, we can't just run around and act like this is the wild, wild west um collect collectiveness or a continuity when you all when we all get together oh, i'm sorry i think i got a little speed back when we all get together um in in this line of work uh in this line of work i'm sorry in this line of work you know we 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 have to i always say this when i work <clears throat> i'm representing myself regardless of I am working for a company, working for a person, uh, whatever, because I'm more I don't do a lot of stuff because of uh, the job I have. I'm technically bound by contract where I can't do a lot of the bar things and stuff like that no more. But the reality of it is. A lot of times I see that, you know, we're just like the Wild Wild West. Uh, I, I said this probably like a few years ago uh, when I really just started to kind of like get into the uh, agent community like that. Um, I, I, I always said that, you know, what's why, why, you know, why we can't put together and, and, and create a, a union 
for the agents. Why, you know, why, you know, why we can't, you know, try to figure out a way where, um, you know, this can be like, like I said, you unionize it through the city. And the reason why I say unionize it is because if you have a union, these bars, you know, the union will set a stipulation, set a standard. So if you feel like you're worth, which I feel like, you know, you should be getting paid 30 to $40 an hour. Think about it. Some of these bars, that's two, three shots. You risking your life. Like literally, like, like me as a, I have a few people that own, they own bars and clubs throughout the city. And I remember, I'm not going to speak to the company name or whatever, because they're known. I'm not going to speak their name because I'm actually good friends with the owner. But I got there and I, I had my gun on me, appendix style, and right in front of me. And this person patted me down. I didn't want to flex my, you know, because the owner came out to get me. I didn't want to flex and be like, oh, I'm with him. You know, it's good. I got my gun on me. He patted me down and didn't find, didn't feel in front of me and didn't feel my gun on me. Even though like I'm an agent, whatever the case and all that is. But the reality of it is, you know, I, I looked and I, you know, I wanted, I, I didn't say nothing because I feel like, you know, it was more of a learning opportunity, but I was just stepping in real quick for a friend's birthday party. So uh, some of the reasons why, you know, some of the stuff that, you know, goes on is, you know, because like, you know, what ha what happens if I was just a regular dude in that club that night and I was going in there to blow somebody's head off that night? That agent technically gave me the go ahead to do that. Do you all agree or disagree? I agree with you. I agree with you. I know a guy. I knew, well, I knew a guy that searched a guy and we weren't there and he let the guy in with the gun he said, well something popped off the vip rounds got to get got to get going and he took one to the head see himself and when we saw the video you see him hand the gun because it was you know police came all that and you see him hand the gun to him so and i would also say to that young man like i would have pulled yo man like you, like my mind would have been like how many other people in here with one exactly very true very true. And, you know, we have to, we, we have to, you know, I, I, I'm a, I'm a firm believer of, you know, you have to, you have to, you have to set the standard of how people are going to respect you in this field of work. Like for instance, Angie, you're a female, right? Believe it or not, females is needed so bad in the agent field but I also believe a lot of females, when it comes to this field, they're more introverted. Okay. I because can believe it's so, that. Because it's, because it's so few of you. Yeah. And like, I, I, I remember, I, sorry to cut you off. I remember. No, no, what, you're great. You're great. But I, I definitely what, understand what I'm saying. As being a female in the field, uh -huh. a lot of people don't really, I won't say respect us, but I don't know if they feel like, like we're more scary. Like I never gave off that, that feeling of I'm See, scared of anything. I don't know because I'm a female and I, I do work like the front gate by myself, like not the front gate, like when you first come in our yard, but I'm in the yeah. bed. So when you come into where the ships are at, I'm right there. I'm the first person you see. And, you know, I try to, you know, I don't put on makeup. I, I wear just the, the plain Jane uniform and I try to look my best. And uh -huh. I always get off an aura like I'm friendly, but don't play too much with me. Uh -huh. So I feel like we're not really. It's definitely needed. Females are needed because it's not a lot of us. You know, I am in a group in Facebook called Girls with Guns, and okay, and it's not a lot of us, but it's definitely employment out there. It's just certain things people just won't do, or they'll be like, "Okay, yeah, I hire you, but I don't want you right front and center because you're a female." And I'm not one of them people. Like I've been through the trainings. I, I did all the trainings that I felt like I needed to do. To be in a position that I that I'm in. Okay. So do, do you feel do you feel like uh Brian, I'm gonna bring you in in one second, brother, as I finish uh talking to Andrew. Why is this going there? Do you feel you hear feedback? Do you hear feedback? No. Okay, cool. Um you know, like, I feel like, you know, and, and I understand that, you know, how you say how that vibe come across or whatever. 
to be totally honest, I I believe that you know um, females. I, I really feel like y'all could not run this field, but be a major, put a major dent in this field. And when I say that, I say that because I'm sorry, everybody saying they hearing feedback. Let me uh, clear some of this stuff out. Get this feedback out of there. Um, I, f- I feel like you know females have to you know create create their space in this field. You know, like like with me, like when I when I first got into the agent field. Yeah, I think the feedback is going. When I first got into the field, this field of work, I, I I really, I mean, I didn't know anybody. You know what I'm saying? I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't know enough people to kind of like to put me on. I didn't know anybody to, you know, I didn't know anyone that, you know, kind of like knew all the ins and the outs. It was new to me. But I got lucky because I had ended up working doing uh doing uh bar security for a well-known company in the city that had a crazy reputation. And once I got with that crew, I kind of built my rep. You know what I mean? Like it's funny because when I when I remember years ago when I first started an agent, like I built my rep to the point where I was on Broad Street doing security for uh P and B Rock Club. I don't know if people remember that space. But I forget, I even forget the name of it. Uh, this was before the pandemic. I used to be out on Broad Street with an AR-15 standing doing security. And I built my rep with the cops and with, you know, cops would come by and be like, you, you good? And like, yeah, but like, like it's crazy because cops was happy because it was never no nonsense outside of that place. Because they knew, yo, it's the big light skin nigga out there with that thing on them. And he gonna do what he gotta do to make sure to make sure everybody is Gucci, you know, once they get in here and once they leave. So I feel like, you know, a lot of us, you know, we have to look for the opportunities to build our reputation, no matter how it is. <clears throat> I I I knew you know I knew the like kind of, I started to know the ins and the outs when I went through that Act Two Thirty Five class I paid attention so I knew I could actually be out here with an AR fifteen and do what I have to do. All right, people saying the feedback happening again. Hold on one second, y'all. I'm gonna bring somebody else in the conversation. Um, one moment. I'm sorry, y'all. One moment. One moment. So just so that we don't, since the conversation don't sizzle out, what is something that you guys experienced in the in the security field that you wasn't prepared for? <laughs> Go ahead, Ed. <Anne. laughs> okay, I'll go first. Now, as a female, <laughs> okay, so um, recently, the last time I did, mm, I was working for... Scotland Yard security, and I was doing a detail where though I was working with Black Hobie Consortium, um, Ayla Stanford. I was, you know, one of her guards, and I had another gentleman on one of her guards. Now, you had the rest of the guards there, but we were armed security. We were um, concealed, so the gun was never seen, but I felt like the supervisor, first of all, the supervisor I had when he first contacted me, contacted me about the position i had already knew him from previous sites i had worked so i knew how he was he was one of them people that really want to give you too much details about what was going on but he would just give you enough to where though you'll be like all right i'll take detail and i wasn't doing anything at the time so i was like i take detail we're right here on 22nd and lehigh you know i'm just her guard you know i go everywhere with her and everything um the thing that i wasn't ready for 
was when we were given our walkies, we was given our headsets, the one that were around ears. Now, the thing is about this supervisor, I really didn't care for him, but I do my job and I do it well. So the gentleman I was working with, he was cool and everything. But the supervisor, I just felt like he was being real shady towards me. Like he didn't give me a headset, so I couldn't really keep in communication. Um, mm -hmm. He was like trying to pass, like make a pass, but I wasn't like with it. Like I'm not one of the people that like, I came here to do my job. And, you know, I had so many complaints about that. And it's like a lot of the jobs I have worked. Yes, people make passes. I don't catch them. I don't have time for that. I come here to do my job and I like to go home. And I think that when we had like, I had like a big falling out with the company. Cause you know, I was telling them like I was being harassed at this point. Like I just want to do my job. And I think the harass, like people say, like, you know, people have been arrested, like females have been arrested at their job. But I got to the point where so I just couldn't take it no more. And to see that I wasn't backed by the company of all these altercations, like I was writing it down, I was putting it in, I was putting the time and the date in. And I felt like my voice wasn't being heard. And I think that was one of the big sides of it. Like I kind of like kind of start keeping my mouth quiet now. I kind of just let stuff just roll off the shoulder. But I feel like that was a big thing to me was the harassment and the complaints and the company itself not doing a better job of supporting their employees. So you sure. felt like you was basically in it by yourself with no support. Right, because at, yeah, because all the guards that was there were men. It was all men. When, I was when you said a pass, like you mean like people was coming at you, like trying to get like you? he was, the supervisor was. And I mean, you know, well, I kept so, telling her, well, like, I'm you, cool, like. You know, I would be professional. Like once I was off the clock, I had to like really tell him like I'm not one of them. Like I'm from the hood. Like I'm you don't know me. Like don't do that. And it was mm -hmm. just like running in one ear, not the other. And I felt like I wasn't being hurt. And that's what was the problem for me. I felt like that's when I really started thinking like, is this feel for me? Like I started really thinking about it. Like I don't know if I really want to do this. I don't want to sound misogynistic, or I don't want to sound like you know. I don't want to seem like I'm not supportive of you uh, in, that, in that stance. But I would say that uh, you you can experience that in any field of work. Yes, no, no, any field, but it didn't no. happen up until this time. Like it's plenty of jobs I had worked on. where someone has said some things to me. But uh -huh. once I boarded to the actual, when I went through the chain of command and start, you know, emailing, sending things out, it was nothing being done about it. So it wasn't that it, it can happen at anywhere. Like it can happen at the site I'm at now. But I haven't experienced it and it was great. But I feel like the company should have did a better job, you know. And I was technically, you would say, new in the field. I have only had my 235 for almost two years now. Okay. How about you, Webb? You want to answer the question? Can you repeat the question, please? So the question was, um, I kind of forget, uh, about experience, right? Right, right, Angie? Yes. The question was about, um, basically about your experience, like, you know, your, your one of your uh, worst or best experiences in the field. Um. Oh, man, I've been around. Um, I'm like going through my Rolodex here. I would have to say, I would have to say just the, the true impact of, this is going to sound wild to somebody, but the true impact of being able to still help the community by still being a part of it and not feeling like you are on the opposite side of something because you wear a certain thing. It's like we have the authority under in areas and do, being in places that the police have to ask us what happened. And so, I don't know. But I think the best for me that, you know, being able to impact the community, stopping somebody, you know, from entering somewhere that could cause mass deaths, mass casualties because we search them and you find the gun. Yo, my man, you know you can't come in with that, cuz. Or, you, you know, that enough. That's enough right there. Because you save somebody's loved one, somebody's mom, somebody's uncle, you know, so on and so forth. So, yeah, that, it's a that's that's for me. Yeah, due, due to my right. experience, for me, that's why you know that's I know that probably like, but well, this doesn't go together. But that's my experience. That's what 
I don't. I can't say I have negative experience. Are you gonna get into fights? Sure. With my attitude, yes, I've been in a few. You know, um, are you gonna get into mind mind bending situations? Meaning, like hairy situations? Yeah, it's it's, it's part of, like it, if you if that's the way you're cut, then you know you'll surround yourself with like minded individuals that will do that. But I ain't gonna take the floor. All right. Well, welcome, Mr. Uh, Brian Hopkins, to the Stirring the Pot podcast. I Thank you, sir. Thank you. You wanting to join. I do appreciate you. I wanted to welcome you properly. Uh, so obviously you've been listening to the uh, conversation and uh, it would be wrong for me without me giving you the opportunity to give your input. So if 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 you wanted to answer the question or you want to just give some input and some wisdom and some knowledge, uh, you are more than welcome. Or if you want to just dive in and answer the questions with the rest of the panel, it's totally up to you, my man. Well, basically what I wanted to do, and hopefully everybody can hear me, is in my uh, in my 20, over 20 plus years of being an agent, I'm on my fifth recertification. Wow. And the one thing that I've done throughout the years is I've mentored agents on a much different level than most other, you know, older guys in the business. The one thing that I find that is real unfortunate with agents is that one, they start out using the wrong terminology first. To be an agent does not mean you're security. It does not mean you're anything until you can get contractually obligated to something that gives you power. We don't get a certification in order to be something. We got the certification in order to have a production of doing something based on what our qualifications are. When you look on your card, it says certified agent. It doesn't say certified security. So I need people to get away from using the term guard and other things of that nature because we've progressed beyond that because you're trained individuals. If you've invested as much as I've invested in myself on top of what was invested into me with all the levels of law enforcement I've been on, I do not want to be retracted back to something that just is observe and document situation. Second of all, let's understand one thing. When you go, when you get hired by a security company, you are under their auspice in reference to what they want you to be, not who you actually are. Because the Privately Employed Act of 1974, which is the Lethal Weapons Training Act, does not promote being a security officer. It just means that in the course of your duties, you can do a security detail and then actually be paid for that detail, whether it's for yourself or a corporation. So a lot of people and I, and I teach a lot of this stuff not just on the aspect of just general knowledge, but I have an agent in the law class. And my agent in the law class really tells agents and shows them where they can find who they are in criminal law digest and in the crimes code. So you understand when you're contractually obligated, you have a responsibility over and above observe and document. See, the thing is this. People keep using the term 235, but do we call a cop a 120? <laughs> Not at all. So if we don't call a cop a 120, why do we always reserve and call to ourselves 235? That's only because the slang term has taken over the actual term, which diminishes our yes. argument in any legal text. Very true. So the reality of it is, is let's understand who we are under the law. One who carries a firearm in the commission of their duties is deemed a law enforcement officer. How many times do other agencies tell you you're not a law enforcement officer? Well, we only have one set of laws in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. How could we not if we're tasked to be on private property to make sure people play civilly? How could we not be law enforcement officers because we have the power to protect ourselves just like any other sworn entity? Mm -hmm. It's those things. When you don't know who you are, then somebody's always going to give you a definition. Ignorance. Now, when you, talk, when, when you talked about uh, the aspect of unionizing. OK, you can't unionize something that isn't already put together. So understand one thing about the union ideology for agents. It's not going to work if you don't have a collective mind. Very Most true. agents being singular and always claiming that their team is better than the next team will never find compromise and understanding that is safety in numbers and that we need to get together first 
and then create a template that all of these bars and clubs and everything that you do will start to understand that they can't get around us. It's the same way they do with the police department, the sheriff's department, any other department. When you Mm -hmm. have a nucleus of people that individually think out, that only think in one track, then guess what? It's easy to defeat them. Mm -hmm. Make sense to you? Absolutely. So let's understand one thing. I started this agent association of Pennsylvania close to 20 years ago, myself and Tracy Bennett. We we had a meeting with about 40, 46 agents in a room as Stan's tires. And I gave the speech how Gendro was one of my speakers. Mike Hall was one of my speakers. I had some of the top people in this business understanding what my ideology was and said it was a great idea. But you know, you know who the great idea fell on? It fell on the people that I was talking to in that room. See, because Mm. they couldn't understand how the true collective works. Because if you're not part of an organization that already demands you to do things as a team, then when you ask people individually to become part of a team, they have to see where their individual benefits are. If you can't put their individual benefits in front of them, then they have short-sighted vision. Absolutely. In order for agents to deal in this litigious society that we call Pennsylvania, and I'm just only going to say Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, you have a union ideology that's going to step on your neck every time you try to do something on a larger scale. You know why? Because the police department and every other organized department is going to try to get that money that they feel as though they're losing because you came up with a great idea. So let's understand one thing. Be careful what you wish for, because In order to do something on that large of a scale, you have to have organization better than the average because you don't have a township. You don't have a borough. You don't have a municipality behind you to protect you when somebody unfortunately does something out of character or wrong. You see the difference? Mm -hmm. See, the thing of it is, is this people people do things based on what their information level is at the time that they want to do it. The problem is that so many agents out here are not mentored or affiliated with people with good information. Mm. Now, let's say you have parallel universes in in things, right? Now, an electrician and just say a plumber. Mm -hmm. Would I want an electrician telling me as a plumber what to do? Not exactly, because his focus is really on electrical work. But can he tell me something that's only taken in consideration? He understands electricity. Mm -hmm. But how many cops or former cops are teaching us how to be agents and never been agents? None. And we take their word face value. You know why? Because we don't have any other thing to go by. Myself and Juan Clark, we started a school about 10 years ago. And we had it up and running. It was called PLETA, Pennsylvania Law Enforcement Training Academy. And you know what our motto was? Agents teaching agents. You know why? Because if you're not being taught by somebody who's been in the trenches or can see things and give you a heads up, then what is the use of getting that training from them from a standpoint of truly understanding? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that cops can't teach us something, but the reality of it is, is that in order to understand, I've been doing bars and clubs for over 26 years. And the one thing I've never been compromised, I've been raided in bars and clubs over 15 times, never had my gun taken, never had my credentials taken, never been compromised, none of the above. So when when guys call me and tell me that their guns was taken and all this, I still try to understand what they're going through because of the fact that guess what, just because it didn't happen to me doesn't mean that it doesn't exist out here. Yes. And the one thing that we have to understand is if you know who you are, then your argument becomes less. Now I don't argue, I debate. Because I debate with my cousin. He's the, he's the supervisor in charge of um, the detectives at 8th and Race, right? Mm-hmm. I argue with him a lot. You know why? Because he's been a cop since he was 19 years old. He's in his late 40s now. And the one thing is, is that when you become a cop and you've been a cop for so many years, you're indoctrinated in a cop way. Absolutely. That's a us versus them mentality. Agents, we don't have the luxury of saying it's us versus them because it ain't very much of us that will come at a moment's notice. Mm -hmm. See the difference? 
So an agent's persuasive skills have to be better than their, you know, physical or, or pers- other other aspects of their skill sets. Mm-hmm. We have to finesse a situation because if we get physical, we got to do it on our own for the most part. Yes, sir. So when you work in that bar and that club, you set your stamp on it before you even have to get physical. Now people either try you or they won't try you one way or the other. Mm -hmm. I've worked every I've worked every part of this city bar and club in the Badlands, West Philly, North Philly, South Philly, the whole nine yards. And everybody that knows me, Beehive, everybody that knows me knows that I preach one thing, rain, scope and jurisdiction. Now, the young lady that was speaking earlier, Scotland Yard, I know the owners of Scotland Yard. We grew up together. The one thing is, is about them is they don't give you rain, scope and jurisdiction. This is one of the reasons why you had the problems that you had in reference to that. Range would be the depth of your authority. Scope would mean your job description. Jurisdiction is how far in geographic location do both of those things take on the major aspects. When when a stupid advisor doesn't give you the information that you need in order to do the job, then guess what? He's already setting you up for failure unless you're a very smart and intelligent person and you gather that information on your own. But it's not up to you to get it, because if I orchestrated the contract, I should be able to tell you those three things without even blinking. How many times do we take a bar or a club and we do security there, but we don't even go on an off day before we even take it over to see what the clientele looks like or see what the area is? How many times officers show up at a bar or club and they don't even know the history of the people that's coming into that bar? Because most times out of not, it's not anything in reference to the bar itself or you. It's because people bring their history and their past into a bar. So most of the shootings that happen in a bar is because that person that's sitting in the bar did some dirt out in the street. And it was much easier to get at him in the bar than it was to get at him at his house. Mm-hmm. So you got to understand when you're doing these these type of things, rain, scope and jurisdiction is going to play a major part. Do you do diligence and do your homework? How many other times do we have agents working in bars and clubs that don't take their credentials to the local district? Mm. Take your credentials, a color copy of credentials to the local police district. Speak to the captain and let them know what your purpose is there. It takes your bar off the nuisance hotline. It shows them that you're willing to play. And when they come, they don't have to question you about who you are and what what you're doing. So to speak to that, I uh, funny that you say that. So. I I remember picking up a bar for someone who had had it under contract, didn't have nobody. It was paying good money. And when I'm not familiar with the area and everything, I call the district of that of that surrounding bar. And I let them know. I say, hey, my name is Gary Bryant. I am such and such and such and such. Uh, I am going to be working at such and such bar tonight. I just want, you know, your officers to be on standby because if they see me, depending on whatever detail is, because some details ask you have actually asked you to have a long gun, have a sidearm or whatever the case is. And uh, so I let them know because, you know, you a cop be driving down the street and see some weirdo with an a, a AR or a, a shotgun or whatever the case is. They might be like, oh, they're getting stuck up or anything could happen. So, right, but they don't know what we can and can't carry them. They're exactly. always willing to tell you what you can't do, but they can't tell you what you can yeah, do they because can. they don't know what you do. Absolutely. We can do five different things in a 24 hour period and never lose our title as certified agent. Absolutely. Absolutely. See, the thing is, is this in my 26 years of working bars and clubs, I've never carried a long gun and carried it on my person when I was inside of the bar or when I was outside of the bar. Only time I went to get it was when it was needed. Other mm-hmm. than that, I'm not saying that times are just like they were when I was younger doing this. I'm saying you have to evolve with time, but I never needed that. Only mm-hmm. because when I get involved with something, I learn the peripherals of it. You have to know the peripherals. You have to know something about the people that are coming to that establishment on a current basis that gives you an understanding of what could pop off. Exactly. Can I, say, can, I can I just add in there? Um, I think it's like, I know, I hear what you're saying about the long gun thing, but I'm a long gun guy. So I kind of like scratch my head like, huh? Because, you know, I, it might also be an age difference here. I'm not taking a shot at it. No, no, not might. Not okay. might. It, well, it okay, is so, an age difference. Okay, so there is. A, okay, there is. For in fact, I was born in 87. You listen, I, listen, I graduated high school in 86. But what I'm right, saying so, is this. 
So this great hair is, is, is the way it is because I'm not arguing with you. I'm just I'm, I'm so, I think and I'm agreeing with you a little bit, a little bit, just a smidge it here. All I'm saying is from my point of view and from the different generation is that we know that a revolver in a 40 or 45 ain't really going to happen because they might have a Draco. And I'm going to bet my bottom dollar that they'll have a Draco. So I'd rather walk around with a long gun to protect the community and to protect my life because I know that this nine or this 40 may, it may or may not be able to match what's coming at me that my brain knows the young boys or different people have that's going to hit you anyway. That's all I'm saying. So I'm not arguing. Oh, no. I Listen, I fully no, agree with that's, you. That's, I'm not going to each his own, brother. You got to understand about your training and how much you have invested in yourself. I'm a firearms instructor. I will never tell anybody to limit the amount of firearms that they're attributed to. But what I'm going to tell you in my life, I've never needed because of my understanding and my persuasive aspect of how to deal with problems and situations. A situation has never gotten outside of me that I needed that long gun. But the understanding is this. I can't say that everybody's options are the same as mine. Would never agree to that. Just like I don't believe other people putting their morality on me, I'm not going to put that on anybody else. If you need a long gun in order for you to maintain your protection, brother, go home to your family every night. Put that long gun in a secure place when you get home and use it the next day. I will never tell anybody not to. But what I would tell you is this. Understand verbal judo is just as important as carrying that firearm. Absolutely. Understanding you know, who you are and how you communicate, not using code words and other things of that nature to bring the focus on you. See, the focus can be on whoever's in the bar. That's between them. Once you get them outside of your establishment, then I don't care if they had Draco. I don't care what they had, <laughs> but they're outside of my jurisdictional responsibility. So guess Absolutely. what? If they want to put holes in each other like Swiss cheese, then have at it. But I mean, I'm not going to be a witness and I'm not going to be involved in it because guess what? I've done what I was paid to do to make sure that the establishment is OK. And this is where range, scope and jurisdiction comes in. A lot of guys think that if somebody's fighting on the sidewalk and you because you pat people down on the sidewalk, that's your responsibility. No, it's not. not. Because legally, you have to understand where you are. Logically, you can do whatever you think you can. But legally, you're going to get your ass handed to you because guess what? <laughs> in a court of law, legal is not emotional nor logical. It's just, it's just so legal. So understand, if you don't know range, scope, and jurisdiction, brother, it's all going to be one of those things where you're going to be fighting for your, you know, for your freedom as General Joe out here, never having a law enforcement ideology put behind you. You're not going to get the benefit of the doubt. No. I've seen that many a time. And the one thing that I want to tell people as a mentor, I tell all my guys, Joseph De Jesus, who was commenting earlier, I mentor him. Louis Pedraza, I mentor him. I mentor about 50 agents so behind the scenes. I'm not a real flamboyant dude. I don't have a big ego. But I want to make sure these guys walk away with the best information so they can go home to their families and they can make a mark in this business. I've okay. seen people that came into this business without two nickels to rub together. And you know what? They're starting to make money because they're gaining contracts now. They're doing other things. That makes me feel good. I don't have to be a part of everybody's success other than to know that I gave them the foundation of information that made them secure. There's some people in this business that I wouldn't even spit on if they was on fire. You know why? Because they're detrimental to the agent community. You know, and, and the fake agents out here, I know a few of them. I've mentored a few of them before I found out that they were fake. And once I found out, I didn't make him a villain. I just said, listen, stop playing. When you when you can actually be real, stop playing. So the reality of it is, is that you take the good with the bad, but you learn how to clean up the mistakes in, in any industry. You were talking about you getting patted down. Gary, you was talking about you getting patted down and a brother didn't mm -hmm. feel it. How about how about on par police officers pat people down and put them in police cars and they still have firearms on? Or they still have strong. some type of dangerous wow. equipment. On. So yep. understand one thing about this agent community. I was a lieutenant at Delaware County Prison. I'm trying mm -hmm. to tell you, I got pat down skills that was knock the socks off people. But guess what? Inmates and people with inmate ideology is going to get past you. Don't ever beat yourself up about the initial 
but always understand and know that you got to be prepared on the after effect. People tell me, oh, my pat down is all that. My, I said, listen, stop patting yourself on the back because trust and believe there's one person out there that's going to beat you at your game. Absolutely. And all you got to understand and know is being humble is not having your opinion, but it's just understanding that you can be beat. Nobody is perfect. Nobody. And the thing that is, it what, it what really gets me is I've been trained by Fed, state, and local in all of the above. Firearms, pat downs, control techniques, interpersonal communication, all that. And I'm still learning every day. I got more, I got more time in this business than a lot of people have been on this earth. So Absolutely. the thing of it is, is what I'm trying to tell guys is all the time, keep investing in your craft. You can never be too smart in this business. So, b -Hot, let me ask you this, um, because, I mean, I'm not acting like I'm in, I am the golden standard. I have I'm, I'm one of them young dudes that always listen to the OGs. It just was ingrained in me. Uh, I've always uh, always yeah. had a lot of guys who who was older, who had wisdom. And they was like, listen, you better listen. And I, I just always lean towards listening to someone that I know have been through it. So since you are in no disrespect by saying you're an OG in the game. I love it. I love it when you call me an OG, brother. That's the term of endearment. I, I, can just, I can just tell that you are a real OG in the game or whatever, just from your lingo. If if you was going to school a, a new agent, somebody got a year or less in the field, what would be the main, th besides rain scope and uh, jurisdiction, what would be the main things you tell them? Because I, I like that ideology. The first thing, the first thing is your net worth is going to be reflective of your network. OK, be conscious of the people that you are surrounded by and always pay attention to what people tell you you can't do. OK, main reason is because you don't know if that's coming from a place of a person that never could do. That doesn't mean you can't do it because that person couldn't do it. Uh -huh. And you got to consider the source. And a lot of times of what people tell you. <clears throat> in this business because what it comes down to is this. There's a lot of ego in law enforcement. Absolutely. And then you got to differentiate who is the, who has the less ego and more good information. I tell young guys all the time because I'm, net, I'm networking and I'm mentoring on a regular basis and I tell them all the time. The first three things I'm going to tell you is range, scope, and jurisdiction. Okay. The next thing I'm going to tell you is your net worth is great, is, is attributed to your network. Surround yourself by people who have good information. Now, it's hard because so much information sounds good, but it's not good for you. Absolutely. I, got, I always had cops. I was in a forum one day and the police were saying, well, you know, agents can't make an arrest. I said, well, let's understand. We had a we had a statute from the fucking 1900s that citizens can make an arrest unless they change that law. Why can't that trained person make an arrest? Because at that point in time. If a trained person makes an arrest, then they become an agent of the state, not a certified agent. They become an agent of the state because something happened in their physical presence and they acted upon it civilly. So the thing of it is, is if you're within your range, scope and jurisdiction, can you make an arrest? Hell yeah, because that's what you were contracted for. Absolutely. See, police officers, and this is what I teach in my agent of law class. Police officers are employees. Why does everybody give these cops magical powers? Oh, a cop can carry off duty. He doesn't need a license to carry. Well, guess what? <laughs> That's only because of the understanding that the police department has with the city of Philadelphia. The police department is not a part of the city of Philadelphia. They're a contracted agency. That's why yep. their contract comes up every five years. So the understanding of who you are as an agent, if you're contracted and you maintain employed by a contract, then you have all rights and, and privileges as any other law enforcement officer. That's why it says in 6106 Section 6B of the Crimes Code, agents are exempt from a, a license to carry. Hmm. Why would they say that in 6106 Section 6B of the Crimes Code if that didn't matter? See, people That's keep talking as if. Agents are just walking around with a document, a card in their pocket without having some attribution with it. See, mm -hmm. I'm talking about this. I got a card in my pocket. I have a contract signed 
and I provide services. How am I any different than a police officer? Other than a sworn status, but even if I was a school employee, a school police, I would have a sworn status at that. And Absolutely. as an individual agent, depending on the contract that I acquire, I can become that as long as I'm affiliated with a nonprofit organization. So the Philadelphia Police Department, the Sheriff's Department are nonprofit organizations. It's just amazing how people tell me, like when they say, oh, man, I, I went I went over to uh, Triple Canopy, man. OK, Triple Canopy has a contract with the federal government. Yep. So what? So did C and D. So did Alrod. So did all of the other contracting companies. So does Paragon. Paragon has a contract with the federal government. Pinkerton had a contract with the federal government. So what? You can you can go out as a black man in the sole proprietor business, do your paperwork, and you can be on the contractors list yourself. You can bid on it like anybody else. That's it. They put out RFPs, requests for proposals. Yep. All you have to do is line item for line item, fill it in in reference to how you're going to fill it out, and then they will give you a shot if your bid looks good. Absolutely. Absolutely. You see the difference? Yep. See, so many people get talked out of things. Oh, I got this job. They got good like benefits. That. Well, if you own your own company, you can give yourself better benefits. <laughs> Absolutely. Why is it always a situation where we got to look to somebody else to build our dream when our dream isn't in their dream? Absolutely. So I promote entrepreneurialism in this business. I don't promote you going to work for no company. You know why? Because a company will never appreciate you for who you are. The right. only time I tell you to go work for a company is to gain your experience in different aspects because you need that. Nobody can run their company when they're blind to the realizations of the industry. Absolutely. But other than that, once you get educated and once you have some knowledge under your belt and you have that aspiration, why harness that by being somebody's employee? I was sick for the last two days. All mm -hmm. I did was call my partner and say, yo, man, I'm feeling bad. I'm not coming in. Okay. <laughs> it wasn't about having sick days. It wasn't about arguing with a supervisor. Oh, man, that's my stuff about this and about that. You know why? Because me and him are partners. We're brothers. And the thing of it is, is this. It took me a long time to believe in myself. I leaped out on faith about 16 years ago, brother, and it's been tough, but it's been most rewarding. You know why? Because I get to talk to brothers like yourself uh -huh. and I get to talk to you from a free standpoint. I don't have to go right. punch somebody else's clock in order to identify my work. Mm -hmm. I punch my own clock, which is harder to punch than anybody else's clock because I accept 100 mm -hmm. percent of the re responsibility and liability. Absolutely. So it puts me on point to keep my edge and my understanding of this business top notch before anything else. And if anybody on the broadcast wants to contact me in reference to mentorship, anything in this business, don't hesitate because I want to make sure that first thing I said, brain scope and jurisdiction. I want to make sure that agents know this. So when they embark on new things in their life, they understand that this principle is going to weigh heavy in everything you do. Range, depth of your authority. As a man, what is your authority as a man? Let's let's break it into the man thing. Range is the depth of your authority inside your household and outside your household. If you don't have a definition of that, how's your woman going to understand that? Scope, job description. If you as a man don't have a real job description for yourself to understand certain things are just under your purview. How is that woman supposed to understand, duplicate what you marry, you love you and all that when she's inconsistent with how you're going to do things? Then you have jurisdiction. How far does your protection lie in the jurisdiction? Inside your house, outside your house, two feet around your family. You have to know that. Absolutely. So this brain scope and jurisdiction is one of those applied knowledge things that take on a lot of meaning. And when you apply this to more things than just one in your life, then you'll understand and how to be a better person. Mm. But listen, I took up a lot of time. Uh, you know, no, I listen, a no, little bit of value. Uh, you you definitely have have dropped gems. Um, yeah, and that's why I wouldn't have cut you off. I wouldn't have cut you off because you know you know when someone is talking from 
real experience and dropping real gems and when someone is talking nonsense. So we appre- I, I appreciate you for getting Man, I, I appreciate you for having this forum, brother. So so I want to invite uh my man David Jones and my brother uh I don't know how to pronounce your name, bro. I'm not even gonna lie. Is this is it Sadiq Sabquit? Uh, I think he might have uh, got mixed up. But Dave, are you on David? David, can you hear? Yeah, but it's kind of coming It's just me. You say that again? <coughs> can, y'all, yeah, yeah. can y'all brothers hear? Can y'all brothers hear? Stop it. Give me. If it's coming in choppy, you might have to reconnect. I don't know why it's coming in choppy. It's been good for the last hour. <laughs> but um, since we still got you on here, OG, I'm going to ask the group a question. And any, Well, we're going to talk about something uh, a little different, not just pertaining to only agents, but about a current event. Um so I want to talk about the the uh, man in the wheelchair that got shot in Arizona by the cop. Are y'all familiar with this uh, incident? Of course, of course. So, given that situation, I, I looked at it because I'm like, I'm in in places like that. It looked like he might have been at a, a a Home Depot or Lowe's. He was. He was at a Lowe's. He was at Home Depot. Right? I read I read part of the article. And when the pandemic was popping off, I remember Home Depot having agents work there. Well, they Home Depot in the in the city of Philadelphia had constables working. Constables, okay. All right. I worked Home Depot personally. Who 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 worked Home Depot? Who said that? I well, I worked. I worked Home Depot. Absolutely. Okay. Home Depot, like what? Where feet go? Me and feet. What? Oh, feet. You worked Home Depot too, bro. Is adding people kind of slow. Can y'all hear me? Yeah, we can. I can hear you. Yeah, y'all sound really, really low. I'm gonna try to uh, get back on once I get to the house. Okay. So, so give us, yeah, give us. Your low. I'm gonna get my AirPods from the house and hop back on. Okay, brother. So, OG or whoever want to uh, talk about it, if you know enough about the situation. Give us your input on how that situation could have either been avoided or could have had a different outcome. It was an egregious use of force, plain and simple. Mm-hmm. It was a, it was against departmental policy. It was against the force continuum. It was against everything that we understand in terms of the escalation or de-escalation of something. When you deal with something as minor as that, it should have been a, a, a track and observe, and you outnumber the situation. If they had three or four officers to stop that little motorized cart, it would have turned out to be nothing. They could have used OC. They could have used a taser. But obviously, this man had medical conditions. He did not have to be shot. And the officer that shot him should not get any benefit of the doubt or anything like that. Same thing with this Potter chick. You're going to spend 20 something years on the force and then be an instructor and you're going to do all of this stuff. But then you're going to pull your gun instead of your taser Uh and then know that you did something wrong right afterwards. But then you're going to say in the courtroom, not guilty. I understand you got to save yourself. But guess what? There's no egregious mistake that gets overlooked in terms of death without paying some type of penalty. Absolutely. And And if she doesn't get any penalty out of that. It is a slap in the face of ordinary people, just like any other slap in the face that these that like with uh, Tatiana and all the rest of them in reference to, you know, what was going on. You Absolutely. can't keep insulting the intelligence of the American people and expect to have civility. You can't. It can't right. be two justice systems because I put on a uniform. I'm not absolved of making bad choices. Absolutely. I have to be called on those bad choices. Absolutely. I was talking I was talking to attorney Michael Cord, right? I was on his uh, radio program. Okay. And I was given an uh, understanding of a lot of this insulting of the intelligence aspect is what really gets society pissed off. It's not so much a black and white issue. It's mm-hmm. my intelligence doesn't have a color. 
Absolutely. My intelligence is one of those things that I've worked hard to build. And you're going to try to dismantle it with one incident when I can see for myself that this is not right. Stop Absolutely. blaming black people for being over, you know, over emotional when you've been insulting our intelligence for 500 years. Mm. And you're not going to keep doing it in a free society and expect there's no repercussions from the outside. We watched that man put his knee on this brother's neck for nine minutes. And you want to tell us in a court of law that, oh, well, he must have died of heart failure or he must have died of his drug overdose or he must have died of this. When we saw moments before, he was laughing and joking in the store. Absolutely. Really? And Absolutely. you really want us to believe something like that? Mm. See, what it comes down to, man, is this qualified immunity, how they spell it out in the law has to be one of those things where it can't be a black white issue because unfortunately white boys are getting shot too. Yeah. And the thing of it is, is that it's not national news when a white kid gets shot. It's only white. It's only national news when a white kid does the shoot, but white kids get shot too by the cops. Yeah. And we need to, we need to balance this understanding of the egregious nature across the board so we can get some traction. There if we go. keep making it a black issue, it's not enough of us to make it mainstream. You want to know why other communities get their, their situations looked at? It's because they're willing to fund the operation. Absolutely. They Absolutely. take what's necessary to put the money and the resources behind their initiative so it gets in front of the people to make change. And Absolutely. if those people don't want to make change, then they do the same thing by getting rid of them, getting people that are more sympathetic to their cause. So I always, especially to my core group of friends, I preach economic power empowerment because I feel like when you have the money to make change, you'll get the change you're looking for. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Because money, money in and of itself is not the issue. Nah. Money, money is the precursor to gaining the power. There you go. Because what it comes down to is I can be a fool with his money. That don't mean I got power. I have to yep. network with other people that have the same resources and apply those resources in a collective. And That's what creates the power. Absolutely. That's what I was talking about the agent community earlier, right? Mm -hmm. Too many singular things, too many teams over here. Oh, we got the pet down team over here. We got the AR team over here. Uh -huh. If we put all of those teams together, what would we be? We would be a formidable force that everybody would have to look to in order to get satisfaction on a private scale. Absolutely. But no, everybody wants to be, oh, I got this contract. I got that contract. It sounds real good. But if I show if I, if I, if I, if I put a contract on the screen and I said, read it, how would they decipher it? Some a lot of these cats to. don't know what contract language is mm -hmm. because it's not an easily read document, just like no. the Bible and the Quran. They're not easily read documents. Not easily mm -hmm. read. They don't they're not supposed to be read like a book. Because it's a life, their life, uh, their life uh, uh, asserting books. Mm -hmm. So if I'm trying to make a point in this part of my life, it's not going to be in Genesis. It's Absolutely. not going to be on this hadith or this. It's not going to be like that. Absolutely. Same thing with a same thing. You know why laws in the, in the Commonwealth or in the, in the United States is written in Latin or still written in Latin. Why has it not have been, or why haven't we taken out Latin terms in law? Hmm. People, don't don't know that. That. People don't know that. We, law has been around for so long. Why have we not taken out Latin terms in law? Because hmm. it's never meant for you as the person being represented to have a voice in that body of, of the room. Mm. It's always meant for a lawyer who one who speaks on the behalf of it's the same thing with agents, right? Mm -hmm. If you look at the word agent, agent is one who works on the behalf of others. Yep. Yeah. Certified means that you meet the you meet the minimum qualification for certification. So if we're working for on one or we're ones that work on the behalf of others and the lawyer represents somebody in the courtroom speaking to another lawyer, then guess what? We're already isolated. Absolutely. So Absolutely. let's understand what we're talking about in this greater aspect of things is just know where you stand. Be cognizant of who you are. 
And always, always never fear to network with somebody because you never know what that person's experience will help mm -hmm. in the situation. See, because a person's experience in who and what they are, you never know. That little piece can complete your puzzle. I'm not afraid to talk to anybody. <laughs> not at all. Yeah, neither, neither am I. That's and even as an old cat, I don't tell you guys what you got to do. I tell you what you might need to look out for. You know mm -hmm. why? Because my life hasn't been perfect in this business. Uh -huh. But my information, I will bet dollars to donuts <laughs> that I got the best information out here. You know why? Because I haven't met a person in this business. As long as I've been in this business, got better information than me. Only one that I can say got better information than me is the one who taught me. And his name is Archie Watkins. Mm. Archie has seven renewals. Wow. He's 75 years old. And wow. every time I call him, you know what our conversation is? Rule 234 of the statute. One mm. who affects and the rest without warrant. 6106, 6102, 6109. He drums it in my head. You know wow. why? Because I'm the only one in his class of agents that took this thing and ran with it in such a way that I made it prolific for other guys to learn this stuff. Because you know what? Archie was not an ego driven dude. He made more money than his police officer's sons. He raised wow. them on being an agent. Mm -hmm. Agent wasn't no stepping stone for him. He raised his family. He lives up in uh, um, in Mount Airy. Beautiful home. Had that home for over 30 some years. He had the Patrolman's Association. He used to make over 150, 160,000 a year running his own business. He never mm. had a private detective's license and he never had a license to cap. Uh, you know why? Because he was always contractually obligated. Contractually because he knew what he could do. He could do. Do you think he ever he ever had a run in with the cops? Of course. He yeah, had a he shootout on 52nd Street many years ago. Had to shoot this chick. Hmm. She was robbing a bank or whatever. She, boom. He he ran out after she turned around. He shot her because she was about to shoot him. Uh huh. He took him down the station, cleared him, boom, tried to come back with some dumb stuff. He read him the statue, left him alone. <laughs> he was up in he was up in Langhorn one day. The contractee didn't want him dressed in uniform because he was transporting money. He comes out with his partner. Cops pull up on him. He was like, "What? What? What are y'all doing?" Oh, well, uh, we got a call. He was like, "Man, you ain't get no damn call." Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting out there, they tell him, "Oh, you security." He's like, "I'm security." He's like, "If I'm security, you security." <laughs> got into it first thing he said you want to challenge me call the state police you know why because the state police are the only ones that have dominion over our licensing Absolutely. State police came state police asked the sergeant said listen sarge what's the problem here oh this guy right here you know he he's coming out he got his gun exposed and all that he's like he has a badge on i mean he has a gun what, what, what's the what's the problem what's the issue He's a black man with a gun. That was the underlying issue. Two black men with guns with with and Langhorn. So mm -hmm. guess what? The state police officer said, "Let me see your ID." Showed him his card. He's like, "Okay, this you, right? Okay, no more to see here. Uh, give him back his firearm." Yeah, and we're done. State police officer jumped in his car and left. <laughs> you know what my old head said? What is wrong with you guys? It's like, oh, you just wanted to be a pissing match between me and you because you thought you were right doing what you're doing. Many a time, cop will try to jam you up. Yeah. You know why? Because they're using their oppressive authority against your true knowledge. I tell my guys all the time, if it becomes a resistive factor where they're going to harm you or do something to you, we can always fight it out on the back end. It might cost you a little something. But we oh, can yeah. find it out on the back end. I have never lost a case, y'all. Mm. I have four within the last two years. Four cases of my guys' information being taken, their guns being taken, the whole nine. And in all cases, no more than two weeks, less, less than a week after the case, they got all their stuff back. 
And if mm -hmm. they didn't get it back, they got a voucher to replace their stuff of the equal value of what was taken. Wow. And you know what's funny, OG? A lot of guys in this in our in the agent field, and I want other guys to, to chime in on this. I feel like they don't get as well versed like like you are yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, you know. I remember when I got my at two thirty five, and I'm only on my second renewal. Can you say well, lethal weapons training at? Lethal weapons training at. There you go, because the act truly has a name. It's not even listed on your card. You're right. There's no two thirty five nowhere on your card. It does say you do training at training act from the Commonwealth of PA. There you go. So, um, you know, I remember Mike Hall telling me that, you know, like he's like, yo, a lot of guys are just going to get this car. Well, after they qualified the range and all that is over for them. They're not going to read this packet no more. Can I, can I say something real quick, Gary? What? It's yes, over 60,000 agents in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. 60,000? Over 60,000. Wow. Agents outnumber police officers <laughs> in any geographic location. You know how many SEPTA drivers right now are walking around with lethal weapons training cards? Wow. They don't, they don't have any anticipation of working any place other than SEPTA because they have so much overtime. Wow. So understand one thing about your community, brother. Your mm -hmm. community is a vast community. Wow. Yeah. So when you don't know those simple facts, it puts you on a different trajectory of thinking. This is why this broadcast is so much needed, because I get a chance to give you guys an understanding of the prolific aspect of who and what you do. But you are not magical because you have a card in your pocket. Absolutely. 40 hours of training does not give you That's any possible. understanding of what this <laughs> is. But what it does is it puts you on a trajectory. You think 900 hours gives a, a rookie cop everything that they need? No. They come out and make mistakes. Look at the that two was, cops that shot the mental the mental dude that was coming around a car on him. And West Philly. Yes. Mm -hmm. They were rookie mm -hmm. cops. Wow. See, the thing of it is, is that you got to understand, it doesn't matter how much training that you have. It's the person in the uniform. The person. Training in does not subvert the individual that is receiving the training. I can be, you know how many perpetual students there are out there? People will just go to school and go to school, go to school, but they don't mm -hmm. know shit about life. Don't know yeah. nothing. They retain it. And the thing is this, you can only retain but so much before you have to get a chance to utilize it because mm -hmm. applied knowledge is much greater than theory. Absolutely. Yeah. I can Application. teach you theory about shooting a gun, but if you don't put it in your hand and see mm -hmm. what the recoil feels like and what the grip is supposed to be, sight alignment, sight picture, muzzle control, <laughs> trigger control, all of that. If you don't do that, then guess what? You're going to be a theoretical dude. Mm -hmm. But you're not going to be an applied guy. So 40 hours. People always say, oh, man, this training needs to be more. No. What needs to be more is you investing in yourself. Exactly. Stop bitching and complaining about something that's been around before you was out alive. Mm -hmm. This is 1974 that this was created. Mm -hmm. One of my mentors was one of the ones that wrote the act. His name was Keith Gebler. Keith wow. Gebler, who used to train up Classic Pistol, was one of the authors of the, of the Lethal Weapons Training Act. You know the one thing, the one change that they made of the act in 1975 that none of the instructors are telling people about? Is that we have no caliber restriction. Mm -hmm. You know how many people used to tell, tell agents, oh man, you can't carry the FN 5.7. Mm -hmm. Or you can't carry the AR or mm -hmm. you can't carry that shotgun. Why? We have no restriction. No restrictions. On top mm -hmm. of the fact that is any of those firearms considered lethal weapon? <laughs> no. This is why it's important to call the act by what it is. I like that. It's called the lethal <laughs> weapons <laughs> training. Act. You keep calling it 235, you're going to get away from what it truly is. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then awesome. you get people telling you what you can and can't do. Whoa, I tell, them, I tell them guys all the time, whoa, pump your brakes, bro. <laughs> I carry an old school slapjack. <laughs> I got two of them. I got a ring. I know that's right. Slap, hey. right. When I carry them, guess what they say? Man, it's illegal to carry that. To who? You? It ain't illegal to me because I'm a lethal <laughs> weapons trained officer. I can carry anything that's considered a lethal weapon. Sounds pretty right to me, right? In a court of law, if a if a if a defense attorney or a prosecutor says, 
Um, we noticed that you carry a slapjack. <laughs> okay. Well, when I purchased it, it was not called a slapjack. Uh huh. So what terminology are you using for a piece of equipment that I use on an everyday basis by giving it another name? Mm -hmm. You see the difference? Mm -hmm. It's how you represent yourself. Absolutely. How you understand the tools that you carry. Is OC, is OC the same as pepper spray? No. No. Come on, bro. I'm, I'm looking at the brother underneath you. I, I want you to chime. Is OC the same as pepper spray? I think Webb, Webb or David. I mean, we've been talking no. so, oh, so many questions on the table. No one's going to take a response to Right. Anything. Right, right. Listen, 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 at the y all, y all, sometimes y'all gotta let the OGs cook. <laughs> let them cook. I agree. It, 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 he ain't saying nothing wrong. He giving game. Uh -huh. But go ahead, Web. Answer, answer his question. I said no, like three times. No, it's my bad, brother. No. So. Go ahead, go ahead, Dave. You answer the question, brother. I feel like it's no. It's two why? Days, why do you feel like? See, what it is is this. When I teach, right, it's either you telling me or asking me. If I'm teaching mm -hmm. you, I don't need you to ask me. I need you to tell me. You know why? Because it shows me that you're learning. What it is is OC and pepper spray. Why are they called different terms? Because of the composition of what it is. Now, oh, I'm an OC know. instructor, right? What does OC stand for? I can't pronounce it, but it's like... Right, it's uh, I, can't, I can't pronounce it, but it's... It's, it's called Olaresin Capsicum. Yeah, yeah but it's... Go. Olaresin <laughs> Capsicum. It's always a tongue twister. I mean, there you go. Yeah, listen, I want you guys to learn as much as you are but, listening. Mm -hmm. Ola resin capsicum learn, is made up of three compounds. Mm -hmm. Water-based, oil-based, or foam-based. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pepper spray in and of itself is devised of the same principle as Ola resin capsicum, but it's mm -hmm. made of a lower version of Scoville heat units. Mm -hmm. right. Ola resin capsicum is used on a higher Scoville heat unit because... It's meant for law enforcement to handle a situation at a more distinct aspect than what a civilian will use. Both of them are deterrents, though. That is very true. So, and this is for the whole group, everybody that's on here. Uh, in the day and age that we live in now, with inflation, uh, li living situations, you know, being very strange, you know, very strange. Mm -hmm. Do y'all feel like, and I want you to think about this really in a logical aspect, because we already know, like, like OG said, you're not going to ever get what you're actually worth. But do you guys feel like a uh, lethal weapon training act oper operatives, people that operate under that statute of the lethal weapons training act, do you feel like in this field of work, uh, you guys are paid right? Anyone can answer whenever they feel. <laughs> Man, that, that's a good question. <laughs> um, now, I want you, uh, now, listen, I want y'all to answer this in a logical manner. Uh, a lot of people don't know how contracts work, how, you know, companies might have to pay for uh, insurance and overheads or whatever the case may be. But the reality of it is, in the fair aptitude, do you feel like, uh, in this field of work, you guys are paid right, contingent on what you do. Hmm. How about I'm you, saying, Dave? You answer first. Right. Honestly, I I, I look at it as um, more of an overall thing because we talk about our life here. Being in this industry, it, it requires our life to be put on the line, like any other law enforcement officer that's out there. So when you talk about a price point versus your life, it's honestly, you're talking about it's priceless. It's really, there's no actual price you can put on your life. Um, but to say what most of these companies are paying out there is it's almost chump change. Honestly, if you, if you think about it, even though the overhead and all that, but we can always always backdated to um, when the riots was going. A lot of individuals was getting paid probably $15, $20 an hour to go to work. But when that riot came, jokers was getting paid 60 sometimes 70 80 Depends on who you was connected with in order to, to do these jobs. So you, if you really think about it, like 
you really sacrificed your life for 15, 20, but when some came bigger, that's when they, they upped the price. So actually a lot of agents should have capitalized on that in the sense of like, I'm working 15, $20 an hour before the riot and I'm busting my tail all these hours. And then when something comes, then you are able to afford me more money. A lot of agents should have should have capitalized on that. Like, all right, wait a minute, wait a minute. If it take a major event for you to give me, I would I want it from the beginning. And that's a lot of reason why a lot of contracts I take, I I'll talk to them just real. Like, you really want me to put my life on the line just for this amount? That's not going to work. Now okay. we can come to a margin where it, it values my life. Then we can we can talk about that in a sense. But when it comes to the that price point, it I would say a lot of agents, a lot of companies are paying them, I would say chomp change. Well, I mean, the thing is you gotta understand this. You you're looking at it from an employee standpoint. Sure. Now, this is what I'm gonna teach you guys to do. You gotta look at things from an ownership standpoint of a hundred percent of the liability, hundred mm-hmm. percent of the responsibility and contract negotiation. Let's break this thing down. Your life is your life. When you mm-hmm. when you want to you want to blend your dream into what I'm already building, then you've already said that your life is not as much as you want to build into somebody else's dream. You want more money? Orchestrate your own contract for more money. If you think you're valuable enough, build your own. When you succumb to something, then you don't have the leeway to really say what's right and what's wrong in that situation because you weren't at the contract negotiation table. Most of these guys that work for these security companies don't even use the Freedom of Information Act to find out what the contract is already written about because none of these guys are real apt in doing research. Is what I said earlier in the conversation. You really want to find out what the company is making? Search it. Mm -hmm. The Freedom of Information Act will give you that. All you have to do is go look at the province, the Bur- township or borough, and that information is right there for you. Look at it. Read over the contract. Find out what it is. Because remember I said scope, right? Scope is a job description. You could mm-hmm. be working yep. for the security company, and that security company contract the service with this. They might have a conflict in their job description that will set you up for failure. But you won't know that if you don't know range, scope, and jurisdiction. So let's get back to the money aspect. The money aspect in most situations is commensurate to the responsibility if it's negotiated properly. Mm-hmm. Let's understand this too, that when you when you say, okay, I'll do something, one, you give up your individualism. You become a collector. Two, you give up the right to think as an individual because you gave up that right to be part of a team. Three, Let's understand there's no backsliding unless you just decide not to work for them anymore. Right. So as a as an owner of a school and a partners in four security companies, I tell guys all the time, listen, what you want and what you can show me on paper may be two different things of what I'm willing to offer you at this time until you can show me something. Remember, we talked about theory and application. Yeah, Many yeah. guys come into a situation because you bought a $5,000 gun that it's going to mean <laughs> something. I don't care if you got Halo Sun on your gun or you got <laughs> night sights or you got old light on it or you got You're all right. stuff. I want to know how yep. many situations you can handle with your mouth. Exactly. If that gun is okay. coming out of your holster, that means you dropped the ball. That don't impress yeah. me. That's going to create more liability for me. Absolutely. I don't yeah. care if your AR got the newest t- Leopold scope <laughs> on it or your lower is, is worked out and you got three pound trigger pull. I don't give a fuck about that. I don't care about who you are in that uniform to make sure that you can get the job done without costing me more money through a lawsuit. Absolutely. I don't care how many people you done slapped in your old days or around the hood. Niggas know I'm, I'm thorough. I'm that boy. No, you're not that boy with me. Mm -hmm. I need you to be that officer. I need you to be that guy that's going to create less liability for you. You know how many Mm -hmm. dudes I I run into all the time and they, you know, I see them, they either look like a terrorist or they look like a jack leg. Like, yo, why are you scared to wear a uniform? Definitely. I I don't wear uniforms. I just wear jeans and a polo. 
Nah, that's well, not gonna work. Not not here because I not need here. presence. Command right. presence right. is the first level of force. First if level. If I don't get a good right. command presence right. from you, then guess what? I'm I'm good because that's only going to show me that you're further skill setting up the up the escalation of 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 the force continuum is probably going to mm -hmm. be as sloppy as your first. Mm, you got a point. Until you prove yourself, I, how am I supposed to determine the difference? I'm an OG in this thing. I wear a uniform. Unless my contractee says, I don't want you in any type of tactical or, or uniform type mm -hmm. gear, that's right, because that's it's contractually obligated. Other than that, if you work in a bar or club, why would I want to look like the crowd so the cops are coming and shoot me? Why you think black do. cops don't want to do undercover no more? Because they getting shot more than the damn people that's running away from. <laughs> so we gotta understand, man. We not we not an anomaly. We're black officers out here without a sworn status. We gotta learn how to dance around this bullshit of Absolutely. everybody coming at our necks. Absolutely. You got the people in the club. Oh, you a fake ass cop. You can't do nothing. Uh -huh, run a cop. And, then we, and then when we gotta put paws on them and treat them like a fucking farm animal. Now, all of a sudden, they want to understand who we are. Absolutely. Yeah. But we're not around to sell people on who we are. We need to know who we are before we get to that. Mm -hmm. If I got to sell you on who I am in the heat of the moment, I haven't done my homework. You got to yes. know who you are before you get to that. That way you know what your options are. Mm -hmm. So let's, di let's dive into That's that uh, verbal judo just a little bit more. Uh, Afik, how you how you feel about that, brother? About what's up, guys? Being able to, uh, what's up, bro? How you feel about how you how you feel about your ability for verbal judo? Because I feel like a lot of agents don't know how to talk. Right. Like, well, not people. Verbal, a lot of lethal act, a lot of lethal training act uh, officers. I'm sorry. <laughs> exactly. Well, well, it's, uh, well, well, Mr. Jones, how are you, Mr. Hopkins? How you doing, hey, sir? How you doing, my brother? I'm doing well. Um, verbal judo's got me out of everything. Anybody in here, Web, uh, Web, how's it going? I see you down there, but I don't see you if you're still in here. You're right. In the shadows. Uh, Mr. Pedraza <laughs> is one of my, my, my guys. I love him. How, how are you doing, Mr. Pedraza? But um, verbal judo uh, has got me out of everything. Um, I've always been, I've been doing security for about 15, 16 years. Mm. Uh, and, I, and you know, with companies, obviously nothing. I think his phone froze. Yeah, right. Probably. Seemed like it cut out real quick. Can you guys yeah. hear me? Yeah, we yeah, got. We hear you now. Go ahead, okay. bro. Finish your kits. All right, there you go, beloved. <laughs> yeah. So I, uh, yeah, I've been doing security for about sixteen years. I've been doing armed security for about three years. And uh, it just made it easier for me. Like when you're doing retail, you're working at a Rite Aid or something, unarmed, everything is verbal judo. Absolutely. Because that they don't want you putting your hands on nobody. So uh, what I did was I came from a, an environment that was hostile and a hood environment, projects. Nobody knew how to talk to nobody. So when I went to work, that was my learning thing. I was going to work to actually learn and do my job, but learn. So anybody, there was a guy, uh, there was one guy who, when I really turned it up a notch, his name was John Edwards. I don't know if some of you guys know him, but his name was, his name's John Edwards, and he worked in uh, Rite Aid. And when I met him and I started doing loss, for, loss prevention, um, that's when I turned it up a notch. How you talk to people, how to write reports. Um, if oh, a yeah. shoplifter has a weapon, if you see the weapon, what to do, what not to do, you know, stuff like that. And I just, it just makes my job easier today. You know, like, mm -hmm. like, uh, Mr. Hopkins, I want to get with him on the range scope and jurisdiction. Oh, yeah. I think that would probably, that right there would probably complete my career. <laughs> exactly. Um, Mr. Webb and Mr. Lewis and, and, uh, also, uh, Mr. Jones up there has all contributed to my uniform appearance. Yes, sir. <laughs> so I want to I I uh, thank those guys. Uh, and uh, also, uh, with Force on Force, uh, me and Kenny Webb has done some personal Force on Force training and also verbal judo training, and where in which 
uh, me going into my with my with my 16 years experience, me going into that that force on force was like my first day doing security ever because uh, you know some of the things that I was doing. I think he froze again. Mm-hmm. It might be uh, it's probably his uh, his Wi-Fi Wi-Fi like to act up sometimes. Could be. Yeah. You, you, you back, bro? Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, these yeah these guys uh, they they uh, Kenny Webb. You know, we did we did our first future recovery warrant together, um, and uh, him teaching me force on force. And uh, verbal, a little bit of verbal judo himself, uh, right before hopping out there and doing some very, very crazy stuff in the field with him, beside him, uh, you know, I felt some of those assignments. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I had to, I had to learn quickly. And now it's now it's just like you know, I'm good, man. I'm blessed. Um, I get I get some good work from everybody in the field. Um, and and I use my voice to get out of situations, man. Hey Gary, and can I, I ask I, this I, question real quick? Go yeah, ahead, yeah. Sir. Abu, yeah. Do you be, do do you believe your network gave you the additional network? I can't. Am, am I am I am I here? Can you hear I, me? I, yeah. Uh, now I'm saying like you broke out. Yeah, he froze up a little bit. See what I wanted. To, what I wanted to find out from him is what was his did that network of involvement right. give you a different net worth because yeah, I, a lot of I, times what happens is it doesn't take very many people it just takes a person right or a few people connection. to put you back abu yeah, I'm back. I'm back. yeah i'm back yeah yeah i got you all right, all right. I, 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 the question that i ask is that you do you believe that that network that you had developed give, gave you a different net worth absolutely cool absolutely. Cool. Mm-hmm. I just want I just wanted to learn. I just wanted to know because what I preach, right, and what I've been saying over the years to a lot of my mentees, I want to make sure that the brothers out here understand that what I'm saying is not bullshit. No. That no. I'm in this thing for life, man. I put a gun on every day, mm-hmm. and I protect yeah. other people's property and other people's lives more than I protect myself. Mm. So you got to be a mm-hmm. crazy motherfucker to do that. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, really. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. But you got to maintain your sanity and become a re- and stay a responsible person in the commission of doing that. That's mm-hmm. a hard pill to swallow sometimes yes. because you want to be your civilian self sometimes when that woman, you know, wants to spit on you or when that dude calling you some nut ass nigga like you don't have no life outside of wearing that uniform or, Absolutely. you know, like me. Fuck you, old head. I knock you the fuck out and all that. And I'm mm-hmm. like, really, though? <laughs> really? <laughs> But see, this is what this is what we sign up for. Just like a cop signs up to do what he does, he doesn't become a hero just because he signed up. Do anybody mm-hmm. think he, they're heroes because they signed up to be an agent? Mm-hmm. Now, if we do something heroic, then yes, most definitely, we're supposed to be put on that. But I hate it when people run around and say cops got a hard job. Well, there's 14 other professions that are day more dangerous than being a cop. Yeah, and we much. know. With our limited range, scope, and jurisdiction that we have, we still get the job done, and we get it done more often in in, in greater situations without the same type of, you know, backup as they do. Mm-hmm. So, so all, I, uh, all I say to it is this. They have a tough job to do at times. But law enforcement on that level was never designed to do it by yourself. So when they go running after people and not using their radio and all that, all they're doing is going exactly. after what was what was specified and done way before they got on the force to give them added protection. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because if you look at if you look at a lot of times, most cops that get shot in the line of duty, it was because they went outside of departmental policy for that one moment. Right. Very true. Yep. Adrenaline took a but with us yep. agents, we don't have to be. Look at what happened at maximum level. My man was sitting at the door, minding his own business. Dude just opened up the door and shot him in the leg. Mm. Now, that was my main man that got shot. And, I, and I'm and i like, well, damn, what happened? He, man, he's like, once the door opened, all I heard was gun blast, and I just felt my leg burn. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. So the thing of it is, is we as agents, man, we're sitting ducks, man. Very mm-hmm. true. So we got to always be on our persuasive skills to make sure none of that comes back to bite us because we don't live at that bar. We don't live at that club. We don't live at that hookah club. We just go there to earn a living. So we don't want none of a negative history to meet us at a place that we have to earn a living from. So be careful that verbal judo. I call when I was when I when I was teaching the um, when I was teaching state corrections. It's called interpersonal communication. Interpersonal communication goes over the good, bad, and ugly of communication. And the first thing I try to explain to guys is stop using code words. Man, fuck you, motherfucker, old head. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all right, whatever. Man, I'll knock you the fuck out. Yeah, all right, try it. Go ahead, nigga. Go ahead, try it. Why? Mm-hmm. Why? Mm-hmm. Right, why definitely. You, you in uniform. Why are you going why are you going give this man like, a challenge that he has to rise to? I don't think I would have said that. Right, true. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. And, uh, every, Abu, what, that, what would you say? I wouldn't have said anything. That's what I'm saying. Sometimes <laughs> say, saying nothing sometimes diffuses you know, the situation you know, greater the, than even a response. Some of the elite, most elite guys, I think guys just love working with me because I'm like this. Well, you know, I, about I'm, it. I'm going to go home. I'm making it home. The guy's willing, but I'm making it home. But all my dogs and my guerrilla agents that's out there that's ready to go and ready to knock people's heads off. Right. I'm the, guy, like like, that. I'm, the guy, I'm the guy like, ho, 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 ho. He ain't even crossed the threshold yet. You know what I mean? Just try Right, still on the outskirts. Yeah, he's talking <laughs> trash from two blocks away, man. You know what I mean? Chill out. See, and that's you gotta be thing. careful with that he, too. Then when he then when he crossed the threshold, I'm the first guy over there. See, a lot <laughs> you know of agents so, have to learn how to check their pride before they check. Clock exactly. In. It's just check it's your just pride speaking. before think, you clock I think, in. Yeah. I think, I think classes. You, I think we need to all take classes on situational awareness and how to speak. I'm a certified right state instructor, that, brother. Man. You need to do all of that, man. Because- I'm a certified state instructor on on all of this. What I try to teach my guys, and I teach corrections, and you know how tight corrections is, right? Mm-hmm. When a CO is telling an inmate to lock in, you don't have to tell them to lock in because the inmate already knows they got to lock in. You ask them to lock in, but you give people an ability to make their own choices, right, wrong, or indifferent. But your pen, your pen, um, might mightier than your word Absolutely. so therefore you don't have to say it to him you say listen i need you to lock in for me man fuck you <clears throat> i ain't locking in okay not a problem all right 102 lock in you lock the whole rest of the block in and you know what you do you sit at your table your day room table and you pull out your pen only above date and time and also i, I teach report writing only above yeah. date and time i corrections officer hopkins Instructed inmates such and such to lock in, at which time he did he decided not to lock in. I'm writing this report for attempted escape. Mm. Mm. Now, and I get on the radio, listen, I have a refusal, I have a refusal, possible attempted escape. Mm. And you know what happens when a cert unit and everybody else comes on there? Mm. He's gonna get his ass handed to work. <laughs> and they're gonna take him to medical. They're going to whip his ass first, probably. Yes, Take him to medical. <laughs> He's going right. he to have to sit in medical with the lights on 24 hours a day. He's going to stay in there until whatever heals up. And then he's going to the ass sig. He's going in the hole. And he's going to stay there for until his case come up. And then when they find out that what he did, then he's going to stay in ass sig for about another two weeks. Mm-hmm. Did you have to get uh, angry about that? No. Nope. Just uh, know what your options are, fellas. Exactly. And utilize it. See, my thing is this, man. I want to get the job done with the least amount of effort because my pay ain't going up. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. If I'm getting paid a buck fifty tonight, because I got in the three fights, the owner ain't gonna say, like, oh man, you right, give you a bonus. Hey, here go two hey. money. Hey. Oh, hey. Right. You right about that. <laughs> so, so let me let me let me let me ask the fellas, you know. Just to kind of put it out there, what what was your just in a, in a quick three in a in a quick three uh for two three minutes per person, what what was your most difficult assignment? 
what was your most difficult assignment at a bar, at a club, where, wherever? Jeffrey Runners, what's up, big homie? Where, what was your most? My man, Jeff. What was your most difficult assignment, and how did you handle it? Let's give people should... some gems of how to handle a difficult situation. Who anybody can with? go first. Anybody can go start. You know, anybody. Right, Jones. Go I'm gonna hear Jones. <laughs> I, I'm thinking it. <laughs> One of my most difficult was working a funeral, brother. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's crazy, OG. I was gonna say the same exact thing. <laughs> That's a motion to please. Wait, give, 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 you, give us a little bit of spill on it, OG. It, listen, the funeral in and of itself, we had to be plain clothes, me and my partner, right? Mm -hmm. Because it was friction between the two families. Okay. You know when it exploded and it potentially got out of out of whack is when we went to the gravesite. Mm. Because it's too much of a wide open space and people was coming from all different directions. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the people that hired us, you know, they hired us, you know, to just be a presence. They didn't think that we were going to have to do what we needed to do in order to keep these other this other family from really harming them. Uh huh. So a lot of times we get we get enamored by things. Oh, well, you know, how Gendra will tell you, stay away from them bars and clubs and stay away from this. Well, whoever thought that they were going to have to shoot somebody dead working in a phone store? How about it? Who, whoever thought that they were going to be shot and killed working at a, a corporate office? Our young, our young uh, agent that just got killed not too long ago. Mm, right. He got shot at a corporate office. Corporate so office. So don't ever think that where you're working poses more of an issue because anytime you put a gun on, there's always a chance that something could happen. Always. But working that funeral, bro, cool. I'm going to tell you, the thing is this. I had to run to my car and get my shotgun, right? Mm. And my partner, she was whole, and it, it was a she. Mm -hmm. Now, that was my partner back in the day, you know, and she she stayed with the family, and she moved them over to the limo as fast as she could. I came back with the shotgun. I was ready to blast. Everybody was coming my way. <laughs> And the mm -hmm. bad part about it is I didn't even know who was family and who wasn't because it wasn't like we had real much time to spend with the family beforehand. They hired us within like three days of the funeral because they got messages over text messages and other things that, oh, right. yeah, y'all right. think y'all over. It's going to be something and all that. Mm -hmm. And it was right, right. there at the right. funeral home in West Philly. Mm. Mm. So, Lim you know, you said Linwood? Wood, Wood Funeral. Oh, what's that Wood Funeral? funeral. So, you know, when it all comes down to it, man, nothing is predictable. And mm -hmm. you always got to make sure. Remember what I said? What's the three things that I say, fellas? Rain, scope, and Rain, jurisdiction. Scope. There you go. Rain, scope, and jurisdiction, <laughs> baby. Jurisdiction. Because if, yes, if I didn't or my partner didn't have a great understanding of that, we wouldn't know to be prepared. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Because we would have went to the, we would have ran to the car instead of pulling out a gun. We'd have ran to the car, jumped in and drove off. <laughs> it was that many. I'm telling you, it was that many I'm telling that you. coming out of these people, man. Right. Once we I got them in the limo, good. it was okay because we had the most the people that were you know associated. We got them out of Dodge, but guess what happened? The Mexican dudes that was dropping the body had to do it without the family standing next to the casket. Hey. That's how bad it got, bro. That's serious, jeez. Bro, when I'm telling you, when people's man's inhumanity to man gets into somebody's brain, it's nothing that people can do. People keep talking about, oh, man, it's gun violence. No, it's violence with a gun. Let's mm -hmm. call it what it is, because oh, yeah. the intent is greater than the, the piece of equipment used. Mm -hmm. It's just that a gun allows us to do devious things from a distance. That's mm -hmm. all. Yeah. But that same gun could be put in the hands of a responsible person, and that means that that person saved the life by extinguishing a a, a life that wasn't trying to save other lives. Absolutely. So you can't blame the tool; you got to blame the people. Blame the people. The tool don't get up on the shelf and do the job itself. It needs somebody. This to is operate. why. Yeah, this is why when people <laughs> start talking this gun legislation and stuff, they're going at it from a wrong angle. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I'm not, it's I'm the not individual. Mad. They only want gun legislation when black people have guns. <laughs> Nine, over 90% of white America throughout this country have guns. 
Oh yeah. <laughs> Get out of here. So who 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 wanna answer that last question next? Yeah, I, I take it. I, me and I just wanna chime in on that one real quick. It don't matter. Y'all, y'all, whoever go, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Jones. Yeah, I'm gonna be brief with it. Um I it, actually it boils back to the last um talk session as far as uh, individual or the office knowing how to communicate with people. Um, I would say prior to, to coming over this way in Pennsylvania, uh, which with um, Newark Housing Authority. Now, we talking about the baddest places in Newark, you know what I'm saying? Um, in particular, I was working, I think it was Bradley Court, right off North Mont. Um, and it got to a situation where since we, we, we're we pretty much, we're holding down the fort, we we had individuals inside uh, the court would start trouble outside of it and bring the heat back. So this time they messed with the wrong person and they came in with guns. So it got to the point where everybody had their gun out and the ones that did dirt, they left out where we had to deal with. So when they approached the, the court, with their guns out, we looking for such and such. I'm like, hey, hey, fam, we, we just can't do it here. We just can't do it here. So out of respect, they turned around, but it's all about how you talk to individuals. If you're like, all right, y'all ain't doing this, this and that, and the tension is already there, then that's what promotes individuals to come on property and do so. But if you're not a talk with people, get on that level, and let them know, like, hey, fam, I, I understand y'all got beef, but once you come on this property, then it is what it is at this point. I'm going to have to do what I have to do to protect the individuals in this courthouse and the surrounding area. So it, it boils back down to who you talk to, how you talk to individuals when they are on that level and when you can just break them down. Because we got guns too, bro. At the end of the day, you got to be able to talk to them and bring de escalated down. Yeah. So they love them like, all right, it's you know not going to happen what it, on our property. You know what it truly is. Y'all just going to have to let that go. You know what it truly is? You have to attack people's sensibilities. Mm -hmm. Communication is all about how you attack people's sensibilities. Because yep. when they're at a heightened state of rage, they had yep. less sensible thoughts than anything else. De-escalation is getting people to a sensible, rational aspect. So exactly. when you're attacking people's sensibilities, decoding and using less value terms, then it brings them down unofficially because guess what? A lot of times they're only doing it based on a protection of something. Exactly. Their ego, their, yeah, manhood, ego that pride. their pride, all of those things. But when you show them that, listen, bro, you can bring that down without any judgment right here. Then exactly. you've done all that you needed to do. That's what de-escalation is. The unfortunate part is the police department is not honing in on the true aspect of de, de, de escalation. Oh, yeah. Because they have the bully pulpit aspect because you're going to do it because I said so. Exactly. Said so. And then the way I always I always put it is who the fuck are you? I got one <laughs> set of parents and they don't look like you. Just like when cops tell you shut your mouth. Well, it's free speech in this country. Exactly. As long as I don't, as long as I don't you know, threaten you, then I can say what mm -hmm. I want. I can call you all yeah, kinds of you ass want. motherfuckers exactly. whatever. So the thing is, is that if your skin is so thin that you haven't understood what de-escalation is. Definitely. Because de-escalation creates a wider skin, a thicker mm -hmm. skin, a tougher Definitely. skin. You know why? Because you got to go through the harshness first in order to get to the softness of an individual because the hardness is what most men are programmed to do. Yeah, I'm programmed yeah. to be hard with you. The only person I'm soft with is that woman that I want to take her clothes off with. Absolutely. Mm. So we can't we can't get away from the fact of how we're, society has already told us that we need to be first. But you can break that mold by understanding and knowing that doesn't make you more of a man. That mm -hmm. makes you a boy in man's clothing when you can't understand what the result of that anger is going to do. That's why Absolutely. you have a lot of abusers out here. Because they haven't gotten over personal traumas and they it's just a natural progression to traumatize somebody else because of what you went through. Mm, so yeah. de escalation is more than just, you know, come on, dude, it's all right. No. Right, definitely. De escalation is think about your family, think about mm -hmm. your mom, 
She would not want to see you doing this. Think about your kid, man. You don't want to show them this, what you're doing. Come on, cuz. You ain't mad at me. You ain't come out to argue with me, dog. Bring it down. I'm not your enemy, dog. I'm just trying to get you up out of here so you can live another day. It's those cold words that we got to stay away from. Challenge words. You challenge me as a man, I'm going to either try to rise above it or rise to it, one or the other. I don't want you to rise to nothing. I want you to rise to your sensibilities. So if you come in on my scene where I'm supposed to be the authority, then Mm -hmm. I have the responsibility of making sure that you don't go outside of being a civil person coming in this establishment. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean I got any control over you because you can still do what you want to do. But understand, doing what you want to do comes with repercussions. Oh, yeah, absolutely. One way or the other. But I'm not going to tell you that if I'm trying to de-escalate you. Because right. now what happens to a person? Think about any woman that you talk to and you gave them two options and you're angry or they're angry with you. They're going to take the negative option first. The ultimatum. Because that's the, right. one they exactly. wanna, that's the one they want to hone in on. Like you only said one thing. I said more than one thing. How are you going to just going to jump to this? <laughs> <laughs> that's the human mind. We accentuate on the mind. negative. Absolutely. And when you accentuate on the negative, unfortunately, you don't get very much production. But go. yeah, man, it, listen, I know I've been I've been long winded, but guess what? I just wanted to touch base with you, brother. Anytime you want me back, right, I'll come it. through. Oh, and gee, all you I'm... fellas and ladies that was on this broadcast, hit me up if you need mentor, understanding. Exactly. And the first thing I want to oh. tell you guys, criminal law, Pennsylvania Criminal Law Digest. Pennsylvania Crimes Code. Get those two books before I come back on this channel. Oh, yeah, definitely. OG, do me a favor, OG. Put your information in my DM. I'm going to blast it out all week. Most your name, definitely. Your, uh, every, anything where people can reach out to you, I want to blast it out because you are a great resource in this field. This, I do I yeah, do a lot, I do a lot of matching guys up too. with work. I do a lot of training. I got my partner. He's doing holsters. I got yeah, other brothers yeah, that ever. firearms instructors. I got a lot of connections. I, I just did. need a nucleus of guys that I can set this thing up. And if you guys ever want to create or or resurrect my agent association of Pennsylvania, man, I can't do it by myself. So oh, I need yeah. young I'm guys willing to we put won't, in won't the necessary work. You got the wisdom. We got the strength. I mean, you know, that's how I go. You know what I'm saying? Listen, Absolutely. I'm hit, with you, brother. Hit, hit the ground running right at me. All you give, get the gems. And we get it out there for you, because I'm telling you, you are a resource, OG. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. We appreciate fellas, you, man. Be safe out Let's there, see. Agent One, fellas. Agent One, we gotta we gotta Let think collective, because we can be a collective. All right, Absolutely. y'all have a good one, man. Louis, right, Pagano, that's my man. Jeffrey right, Lewis down there, the man. <laughs> Joseph De Jesus, that's my man. I yes, met him. It ain't not a good man, dude, so right, Duckley. Just letting y'all know that, you know, this ain't no silent mission over here. I'm a very loud speaker. And that all of them guys know range scope and jurisdiction. They Absolutely. all know that I speak that. So when you hear Absolutely. that in this business, B-Hop told you. B-Hop is in <laughs> All right, y'all. Talk to you, all baby. Right. All right, OG. All right. That's the I be up. Dude, we going to get ready to get on out of here, man. We done been on here for two hours or whatever. Right. Hey, I'm looking at the time if like, wow. Want, if, you, if you want to say anything, it'll you know, promote your... uh promote the thing you told me about the light oh yeah promote, promote the light real quick before we get off here oh yeah um i think i, I put it on the, a lot of the, uh the platforms pretty much um but definitely those that doing patrol definitely doing even to law enforcement guys um this this light is 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 pretty much the next thing especially if it's more present especially a lot of a lot of agents a lot of officers are working nighttime this uh-huh. is just just another Pretty much tool to the belt that is just going to pretty much promote uh, public safety and is going to promote more of that. So um, that's my main thing. It's, it's just about the agent safety. Like I had, like, like B-Hop was saying, just know your research. Do your thing. You know what I'm saying? Um, at the end of the day, we're a team. A lot of us got knowledge. A lot of us are a lot of agents coming into the field. They, they wet, pretty much wet behind the ears. Or whatever, but it's not all about that. We got a lot of knowledge out here, especially in the aging world, but just keep it going. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
So listen, man, I want to f- appreciate everybody in the comments, everybody who logged on tonight, everybody, Dave, everybody, uh, Safi, uh, Ange, while she was at work, she probably had to get off. OG right. Uh, yeah. I want to appreciate my man, my man, Jeffrey, big homie in, in the comments. Definitely uh, Lewis, in the up. comments. Just everybody, you know what I'm saying? Austin, just everybody who came on tonight. Ooh. I appreciate you guys. Listen, we're going to be doing this maybe twice a month on Sunday evenings. Uh, that's mostly when everybody can kind of chill down. Not a lot of work going on and things like that. And I want to let everybody know, listen, this is the Stir in the Pot podcast. We're going to have a lot of great guests. I'm reaching out to different people that's willing to come on. And that's what we're going to do. Sunday's a security night. And, you know, we, we, you know, we coming on, we, you know, we're going to be talking about all different kinds of stuff in the security field. We're going to be giving you guys access to different tools to add to your repertoire. Um, <laughs> we're going to get, we're going to get the, the, the knowledge and the school and stuff up with OG, uh, B hop and everything. And yeah. listen, man, we're going to help everybody. We got a space. We got people with knowledge. We're going to make this stuff work. So listen, man, I want to thank everybody for logging in tonight. And I'll definitely probably see most of y'all next week if we do this again. And definitely, everybody, will yeah. know, everybody will know probably by Friday or Saturday if we're going to do it on next Sunday. Um, the holidays are coming up, so I don't want to stress everybody time. So I thank everybody for coming on. One love. Always watch your six and be dangerous out there. Peace. Salute.